great to be here. The bit you all get jealous that I can take off my mask. You know, it is great to be with you all, but we gather uh, to worship God, to praise his name. So if you're visiting today and you've never been in church before, church functions around three kind of elements. First, we want to hear from God, so we read the Bible. Second, we believe we're in a relationship with God, so we pray to him, because like, if you are married and you don't speak to your spouse, that marriage won't last long. You need communication to keep that foundation well. So Christians believe we pray to God and he hears us, but we also love him, so we sing to him, we sing songs. So that's kind of the structure of our service, those three elements. And we see that in God's words. In First Chronicles, David writes this. He says, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. So what David's doing here is saying, we worship a holy, awesome, powerful God. But his first words when he speaks to God is what? Father. Reiterating that relationship. This is a father that we have the joy of coming before and worshiping. Let's pray uh, together now to that Lord that we just sung to. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day one in seven where we can come together as your people to assemble, to worship you. Lord, to remind ourselves of how good, how great, and how close you are to your people. For Lord, we know during the week that uh, situations, our culture, even um, our own uh, flesh, Lord, can try and convince us that that is not true, that you are not good, that you are not great, and that you are not near. So Lord, help us today be an encouragement to one another. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would unite us together in spirit and in truth. And Lord, as we sing songs, they'd be imprinted in our hearts. As we read your word, that, Lord, it would come alive to us and we would be able to connect with it and you. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ today the author and perfecter of our faith, that we stand here or sit here and gather here as people chosen by you, not by anything uh, good or winsome in us, but by your grace and your mercy. So Lord, we pray that this Sabbath day, this Sunday, that we would truly rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to read now from God's word in John chapter 11. Today's reading is uh, quite long, um, but it would be helpful to either have it in a Bible in front of you on your phone. Uh, I'm sure it'll be up behind me, but we'll be referring to it during the service. So we're going to read the first 44 verses of John chapter 11. It says this, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, um, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, for it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death. But they thought they meant, uh, that, that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, 
Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he open the eyes of the blind man that also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour. For he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. And you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. The man who died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Amen. And may God bless that reading of his most holy word. This is the the passage that we are going to look at together uh, this afternoon. So if you have a Bible, please have it open at John 11, because we are going to kind of cruise through this passage at 3,000 feet, kind of touching on the main themes of John 11. But I want to start by asking, who here's had toothache before? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of one of those things we all suffer from in Scotland, isn't it? Um, I got really bad toothache when I was uh, a few years ago and decided to ignore it. I thought I could power through and the pain just built and built and built um, to the point where they had to pull the tooth and then I got osteomyelitis which was way worse than toothache uh, where the, my jawbone cracked but I remember the, the relief of uh, the uh, dentist putting the injection and in, you know where you feel like you're going to drool over yourself um, but we all here have experienced pain and suffering like toothache Right? Something visible, like a broken bone, is easy to see. But a lot of us in this room today are suffering uh, in a more internal way, in the unseen way, uh, through loss, through just worry, through certain pains that no one can see. So the question is, for all of us here today, whether you're a Christian or not, 
How do you deal with the problem of pain and suffering? How do we deal with it? So for the Christian, I believe that we have an outline to an answer in Jesus Christ. But say you're sitting here today and you don't believe. How do you answer the question of your pain and suffering? What's the point of it? How do you fit it into your world view? Now, I believe here in John chapter 11, Jesus starts to unpack for us the problem of pain and suffering. And he answers it in quite an unpalatable way. It's it's quite hard to swallow when we summarize it. He says this, pain and suffering is used for the glory of God and for the growth of our faith. That's pretty hard hitting, isn't it? Uh, It's really difficult to hear. And that's because we can just say it as a statement. It's easy to say. But we see when we're living it out, man, that is hard, right? And that's why we should never divorce a theological truth from the passage that teaches it. So, you know, like if you have a friend who's anxious and you go to them with a sermon in the mouth and say, Jesus says, don't be anxious. That's brutal, right? They're like, they don't know how to process that. But what Jesus does on the Sermon on the Mount says, do not worry. Why? Because your Father in heaven, look how he makes the grass grow, the flowers. He's in control. So Jesus teaches people to look at the character of God in that statement. And here, there's no difference. What this passage teaches us to do is to look at the character of Jesus Christ in our pain and suffering. And what do we see here? We don't see a cold, distant Jesus, do we? No, we see God Almighty weeping. We see God connecting with people around him, being grieved at their loss, feeling pain in his spirit at the suffering of his people. We have a warm, intimate Jesus here in this passage. So like I said, we're going to kind of fly over this passage. We're not going to touch on every point, but just uh, the points that help us answer the question of pain and suffering. So if you want to look with me at verse 1, it opens with a sad but very familiar event for some of us and most of us. A loved one is sick. This person is called Lazarus. We're told he's from Bethany, but we're also told he's Mary and Martha's brother. This is a, just a basic way of identifying someone, right? We still kind of use this. Uh, I come from Fort William, so I use it quite often. I would be like, oh, that's Steve, Mark's brother from Allness, right? You're linking them to a family group. You're linking them to an area to help people uh, know who this guy is. And we, we do that. Even in the early days of the internet when MSN Messenger was kind of thing, everyone used to put up ASL and I think it was age, sex, location. Like it's just a way to get to know people. Here, John is deliberately recording for us this man, Lazarus. And he says he's even the, the brother of Mary who wiped the feet and anointed the feet of Jesus. And why he does this is he wants people who read this account uh, when it was first released to be able to go and find the man. That's the whole point of this. This is historically true. This is John saying, if you were around when this was first published, you could go and find this man, Lazarus. So John's basing this in history. But in the text, we also see there's urgency around this man, Lazarus, right? From the very start, it says he's ill. He's ill. The sisters come to Jesus and say, Lord, he he whom you love is ill. Now, notice the language here from Mary and Martha. It's not a demand. It's not even a request. It's kind of a statement, right? They're just pointing out to Jesus that this man, Lazarus, is ill. But there is an undertone to this. They're like, Jesus, do you see? This, this person that you love is ill. Are you in control here, Jesus? They're, they're almost assuming that Jesus isn't aware of what's going on in the life of Lazarus. And it's a kind of like, will you go and heal him? No, it's a language. They say, the one whom you love. It could be almost uh, manipulative, right? Take, for example, if someone says this to you, and I hope you've, you're not in a relationship where someone has said this to you. If you, would really lo- if you really love me, you would go to McDonald's and get me a Big Mac meal, right? Now, 
we laugh because we know instantly that stinks of manipulation, right? Because if you don't do it, that means you don't love me. Uh, that's the uh, uh, kind of the subtext to it. Now, we have to, in our pain and suffering as Christians, be careful. This manipulative tone doesn't even come into our prayer life because it so easily can. We can say things like, Lord, you are good, you are great, you are all-powerful, all-knowing. So, Lord, we just ask that you would heal this person. What we're doing there is using the character of God against himself. We're trying to manipulate him into that. That's why we're told, let your will be done, right? That's what we're taught when we pray. Or, Lord, I really want this job and this will help me do mission work or pay more to the church and help people around me. So, Lord, I know that cattle on a thousand hills is yours. So would you give me this promotion? We have to fall, watch that we don't fall into this level of manipulation in our prayer life. And there's a hint of this in Mary and Martha's request. They're worried that Jesus hasn't seen their brother. Fear is driving this. Fear. And then Jesus answers them by saying this. This illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So what Jesus does here in reply to them is what? Acknowledge the illness. So he understands. He, he's got it. He, he knows it's happening. And gives them hope, Right? He says, this illness will not lead to death. You can almost hear the whew from Mary and Martha. Jesus has got it. He's seen it. We've done our part. And they go away. However, what do we see in verses 5 to 12? Jesus stays put. <laughs> he doesn't move. He doesn't go anywhere. And Lazarus dies. Then John starts to tell us about the disciples here. The disciples are fearing going back uh, towards Jerusalem because the Pharisees, the Jews, are now on the hunt for Jesus. Any excuse, and they're looking to stone him, execute him. So the narrative's quite complex here in John uh, 11 because on one hand, you have these worrying, grieving sisters, and on the other hand, you have these worrying, fearful disciples. And these two stories kind of go hand in hand. John recounts for us almost a comical event within John 11 in this tragedy where Jesus uses metaphoric language and says, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. They're like, Jesus, if he's sleeping, just leave him. He'll get better. You know, a good night's sleep will make him recover. We do not need to go in harm's way. They're fearing suffering. They're fearing pain. And this is comical because what they are doing here, but by mistake, is they're hearing metaphoric language from Jesus as let wrong, right? Like last yesterday, who was got caught in the rain? In Inverness, it was bouncing. We use language like it's raining cats and dogs. You know, that's, that's metaphorical language, right? We don't expect to walk out the door and get hit in the face by a poodle. We understand that's a metaphor, right? Here, Jesus was using a metaphor and they missed it and they took it as literal. And there's, friends, there's many metaphorical parts of the Bible. And see if we read them literally, we'll end up in confusion like the disciples here. We'll end up in wrong thinking. And here Jesus um, quickly corrects their thinking doesn't he? he says then jesus told them plainly verse 15 lazarus has died and for your sake i am glad that i was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him after correcting his fearful disciples they decide to go with jesus knowing that this is dangerous they're trusting him they know jesus is a wanted man and they kind of their loyalty here it's not exactly faith. It's loyalty first and foremost here from Thomas in verse 16. He says, let us go. And let us also go that we may die with him. They're loyal to Jesus. And they're willing to, to go into a wee bit of pain and suffering with him. There is a serious threat to Jesus in this passage as he draws near to Jerusalem. The Jews are after him. 
And as he draws near, as he comes to Bethany, we see his two encounters, don't we? The first with Martha in verses 17 to 27, and then with Mary, 28 to 36. Jesus meets them both individually. Now, put yourself in these women's place. They had left Jesus at the start of this chapter in hope. In hope of what? Jesus' words, that this illness would not lead to death of their brother. And what are they confronted with now? It's not true. It doesn't look true, right? There's a conflict here. Jesus' words are not the reality that they're facing. Was Jesus wrong? Why did Jesus say these words if it wasn't going to happen? The words that once brought hope and helped them go on their way now bring a bit of pain and fear because he could have been wrong. Jesus could have been wrong here. But what do the women do in this big question? What is going on? The why? Why is this happening? Where do they go for answers? They both seek Jesus, right? That's what we see in the text. Martha kind of shoots out the door almost instantly and meets him. And Martha is direct with Jesus, right? She says this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. When Mary meets Jesus, she says, um, now when Mary, verse 32, came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary and Martha's faith in Jesus compelled them to come to him. But they both come with the same accusation, don't they? To Jesus, where were you? Where were you when I needed you? Where were you in my pain? Where were you at this loss? I'm suffering, Jesus. Where are you? Where were you for my brother? That's what they're asking, right? They both ask Jesus the similar thing. Martha even goes as far to say, if you just ask God, if you just done that, I know he would have given it to you. It's almost an accusation, right? He didn't even do that for us. Both these women are gripped in the pain of loss and grief. And they're battling that big question, why? Why has this happened? Why has Jesus allowed this? Why did he spend two days away when we already told them? But they know Jesus. That's what's drawn them to him. They know his character. Here Martha makes one of the clearest declarations in John's gospel of Jesus' divinity. She calls him God. They're they're trusting in him, even although they can't figure out. We just told the children in the kids' talks there's mysteries. This is one of these ones where Martha and Mary are wrestling with it. And let's be clear, it's painful. It's real. There's sadness here. Even Jesus is deeply moved in his spirit by the pain of this situation. It says Jesus wept, the shortest sentence in the New Testament. God weeping at death and as they wrestle with the why we have the jews present or the kind of like you know in the houses of parliament you have the opposition party that whenever the prime minister speaks they're all like and shouting at them here the jews kind of represent the opposite view and we should be thankful for that because they raise some of the things that we think about in our own hearts in verse 37 they say this could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying. These critical words that they're using is basically saying, is he powerful enough? Could he have done it? Can he do it? Do you know what I mean? So what's the accusations here? What are the shadows that are at play in this passage? Jesus, you're absent from me and my pain and suffering, right? That's one side. Or Jesus, you're not powerful enough to enter into my pain or suffering. That's the two 
threads going down here. One from Mary and Martha questioning, wondering why. One from the Jews. And anyone who's been in pain and suffering or suffered for a long time or has experienced loss that is sudden understands the sea of criticism that now is fluctuating around Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He approaches the tomb, right? And he goes towards it and he's warned by uh, Martha Lazarus has been dead for four days. Like they even say there'll be a bad smell. Why does John require, record this? Well, he's saying, it's basically like saying, Jesus, this dude is dead. He's dead, dead. He's like breaking down. Don't open that tomb. There is no hope for him. There's no hope in this situation, Jesus. That's what they're saying. Then Jesus looks up into heaven, looks up to his father. And why does he do this? Because one of the big questions throughout John's gospel is, is this man God? Is he the son of God? Should we trust him? And Jesus does a prayer audibly to confirm that he is God. He's shown them that he has the power of God to reverse even death. And Jesus, at this point, performs one of his most powerful and miraculous miracles. He calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And the man walks out. He's been resurrected, brought back to life. This is an amazing narrative. And I think this does teach us two things about pain and suffering. That is, for the growth of our faith and the glory of God... But that's hard to see, right? In a world that teaches us that suffering is unusual, not normal, and definitely not good, right? We get painkillers almost as instantly as we walk into hospitals. Like, suffering by itself is wrong, is the narrative that we're taught, or even evil. That some people are even going far to say, if you suffer a lot now, it produces weak character and weak people. Suffering is almost seen as a disease, something to shield ourselves against, something to be, uh, vaccinate our children against so they don't see it. Uh, I think in our culture, in the Western world, we've moved away from um, the visibility of suffering in many ways. Uh, you roll back the clock 50 years ago, a majority of people passed away in their own homes, surrounded by their family. Now, a majority of people die in hospitals or hospices. It's become more clinical because only trained professionals can deal with the rawness of suffering. You know, we shield ourselves again. I think one of the kind of subtle ways this takes place in our culture is in wildlife documentaries. I loved wildlife documentaries when I was younger. My mom and dad used to sit me down to watch it, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, and you'd see the tiger or the lion chasing down the gazelle. And, you know, you're watching it and you're like, well, I hope he gets it because they've got cubs at home. But then I hope the gazelle gets away because it's so cute. And then BBC Two, the lion pounces and just takes down the beast. Now, if you watch uh, modern stuff, they cut away. They don't show you any of that anymore. And then it cuts back to like some feathers or something that's kind of left there, but you don't actually see it. And what they're saying is this is wrong. Suffering on every level is kind of wrong. Now we must be clear that suffering in the world is because of sin. But here we're being taught in the Bible that God can use that to grow our faith. So as Christians, we don't want to shield ourselves away from suffering because it's impossible. Tim Keller writes, who's a minister in Manhattan, he says, No amount of money, power and planning can prevent bereavement, dire illness, relationship betrayal, financial disaster or a host of other troubles from entering your life. Human life is fatally fragile and subject to forces beyond our power to manage. Life is tragic. We will experience suffering and pain, all of us here today. Maybe we are as we sit here. And the wrong line of thinking is this, that it's punishment or it can't be used, it's useless, it's something just to get off. And actually, suffering can grow us as people. And not, be, not to grow us to be embittered, angry people, but to grow us to be people filled of faith 
looking at God. That's what this passage teaches us. Look at it. Look back with me as Mary and Martha's first request to Jesus and his response. They said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said this, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, that's the disciples, Lazarus has died and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Do we see here what Jesus is saying? That he allowed this to happen. He was aware of it. And he says, this is for the glory of God. That he was going to perform a miracle that made many Many believe. He says to his disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there because this is actually for your good lads. You're going to learn more about me through this miracle. He uses the suffering in this situation and the pain of this situation to highlight his glory and his power. You know, it's not... It's not wrong being a weak Christian. Indeed, that's the nature of who we are. We need to lean on Jesus Christ. We need to be aware of the pains that we carry and run to him as Mary and Martha did. Mary fell at his feet, a position of uh, surrender, even when she was battling with the question, why? You know, so what do we do with our pain and suffering? Well, John's gospel is a great gospel. It's masterfully crafted. Here in chapter 11, we have one of Jesus' most powerful miracles, right? Chapter 11 and 12 are actually right down the middle of the book. And it was his most powerful public miracle. John calls them saints. Why? Because they point to who Jesus is. This is God. At the end of John's gospel, we have one greater, right? We have Jesus dying on the cross, taking the sin of the world upon himself, connecting with his suffering saints, us here, dying so that sin was destroyed, dying so that death has no power over us anymore, but wonderfully, a greater resurrection at the end. Jesus, alive in heaven right now, interceding for us. So Tim Keller goes on to say, so suffering is at the very heart of the Christian faith. It is not only the way Christ became like and redeemed us, but it is also one of the main ways we become like him and experience his redemption. And that means that our suffering, despite its painfulness, is also filled with purpose and usefulness. So here today, if you are a trust, if you trust in Jesus Christ, if you love him, you're a Christian, and he can use your pain and suffering to make you trust him more and bring glory to him. Uh, it's hard to see, right? One of my favorite books and movies, because they got made into movies, is Lord of the Rings. I love Lord of the Rings. First movie or first book, what do we see? We see Frodo uh, on top of Mount Wevertop. And in the movie, if you haven't seen it, he gets stabbed by this blade. And all the way through the rest of the books and even the movies, the, bl- the, the wound hurts, right? It's, it's constantly there. But that wound reminds him of his own weakness and the evil that is pursuing him. The evil that's won in the ring back. And Peter Jackson does something amazing in the movies. When Frodo is getting on the boat to the, the new lands, their heaven, he turns around and for a moment he looks younger and the pain is gone. Right? For Christians, we are told in the book of Revelation, when we see Jesus, he'll wipe away every tear. Why is that one of the first things that the Bible tells us about the new creation? I believe it's because we we enter heaven wounded, suffering, and Jesus takes it all away and we see his wonderful tapestry. What was our suffering about? Don't we see that in the life of Job in the Old Testament? 
Job says, if I could only find him, if I could only reason with him, I know he would explain it to me. We have a hope in an answer to our pain and suffering. Now, if you are not a believer here today, what do you do with the problem of pain and suffering? I would say it leads you to Jesus, and I hope that you would trust in him. Let me pray for us. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you now, Lord, um, so in need of you. Lord, in need of your grace, need of your mercy, and in need of your love. Lord, sometimes we feel um, so broken by sin that our love and our own mercy and our own grace just drains out of us. Lord, where the devil can so easily come along and make us doubt that you love us, that make us doubt that you are sovereign and working everything out for your good and your glory. Lord, that when we're in pain, we can't see how you're growing us, it just hurts. So we pray, Lord, that you would give us that wonderful, beautiful gift of faith to trust you more in hard times, to lean not on our own understanding, but to lean on you. To, Lord, even when we're wrestling and battling, why? That we would do what Mary and Martha did, run to you, fall at your feet, and just trust the character of Jesus Christ, our good and great high priest. So, Father, today, if we are sitting here and we are carrying suffering that no one can see, we thank you, Jesus, that you can. We thank you, Jesus, that you are a man acquainted with many sorrows, that, Lord, you can enter into our pain so that we are not alone, not isolated by it. And Lord, give us the hope in our pain and suffering to know that there is a day coming where we will get the answer to why, but to trust you now that you are working in us and through us for your glory. So Father, we pray, grow our faith, help us turn to you and trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, So we come to the benediction now. Benediction is not me blessing you the word benediction literally means blessing is a blessing from the bible so from god and today's benediction comes from first peter and it says this and after you have suffered a little while the god of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in christ will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever amen Amen. It's been an absolute delight being with you all uh, this morning. Um, th- we are thankful for your partnership in the gospel work that we do down in the Merkinch. If you want to know more about us, we have a website. It's just www.merkinchfc.com. And there's a newsletter there if you want to sign up. Uh, it's often a three-minute video by a lot better looking people than myself, so you don't need to look at my ugly mug all the time, but that would keep you informed about what we're doing and how to pray for us as we try to establish a church for Mary Kinch in South Keswick. But thank you all for having me today.